Good afternoon um, and welcome, and I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day um, to um, attend this uh, workshop. So I'm Mitchell Goldstein. Um, as um, was stated, I am faculty at Johns Hopkins University, the East Baltimore campus. Um, I work as a pediatric emergency medicine physician. Um, I also serve as Johns Hopkins Medicine's child abuse specialist. Um, <clears throat> I have been doing child abuse work um, surprising to me, um, almost 20 years now, um, and so unfortunately have seen lots of kids throughout our state and region um, who have been victims of child maltreatment. Um, I am really um, privileged and honored to be able to spend time with you this afternoon because I do see um, the folks who are within this organization to be really important partners in protecting kids. And I hope that we together, um, through this conversation, um, can be empowered to feel as though we have such a dramatic, um, important protection role for the kids in our state. Um, as was described, um, I love interaction. And so please, please, anyone who's out in the um, surrounding area, if you have a question, please type it in. Um, and we can address that as we're going. And um, we will, as described, leave time at the end for further questions. Oh, and also, um, thanks for the reminder, if, if when you put your question into writing, um, if you could just identify yourself by both your name and what your local agency is, um, that'll help us to sort of be able to answer the question that um, more pertains to your specific situation. So our objectives this afternoon are, um, I'd like for you to leave this with an understanding of your role in recognizing child abuse. Um, I think that you will see by the end of this that you have a really, really important role to the children and families who you serve. Two is I want you to leave here with a sense of when to be worried. So what are the red flags? What are the triggers for you to begin to think about this as a potential issue? Um, and then we will talk about particular patterns of injury that you might see um, that certainly should be worrisome to you for child abuse. Okay, so let's just talk um, a moment for why we're having this conversation. Um, why is child abuse and neglect such an important issue? Um, probably the, the, the easiest answer to come up with is it's really, really common. So I'll give you some numbers. Um, we at Hopkins serve as the statewide trauma center for all kids in the state of Maryland. So we are sort of the shock trauma for kids. Um, in an average year through that program, we see about a thousand kids who have been the victims of abuse and neglect. Okay, and these are children who are severely affected with very significant injury. Now, to put that on another sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, idea, in our emergency department, we see all children of which there's a concern of abuse or neglect for Baltimore City, so one jurisdiction. And on average, we see seven children a day who have concern of abuse or neglect. So we're talking about a very common issue that unfortunately we will see no matter what part of the state we work in or the types of families who we interact with. If you look at global stats, um, there are on average 3 million reports of child abuse to child protective service agencies across the country. Um, when you look at actual numbers of victims, you know, it's sort of around a million, you know, depends on the year that you look at it, with a rate of 12 out of every thousand kids being victimized. So this is not an uncommon issue. When you look at the type of victimization that kids undergo, um, the vast majority of victimization is neglect, followed by physical abuse, followed by sexual abuse. Sexual abuse tends to get all the media play. Um, that's sort of, I think, where that you hear about it, um, but it's actually the less common of victimization to kids. 
And the most important thing is when you look at the numbers, the most likely victims of child maltreatment are the children who are going to be coming through your offices. It's the children 0 to 3, um, 0 to 5. Those are the kids who are most likely to be abused. And think about it, those are the kids that really don't have any eyes and ears of any other agency to be able to protect them. For our state, if you look at the numbers, they're very similar to the numbers that we see um, nationally. Um, again, with neglect being the vast majority of cases, um, physical and sexual abuse sort of um, are uh, equal in this regard. What I do want you to realize, and I think this is very, very important, all of those numbers are numbers that make it to a reporting agency, okay? So it means there has to be recognition, and there has to be a report. We know that that is just the tip of the iceberg. There is many, many, many more children within our state who have been victimized who never make it to anyone's attention to be counted. And again, I think that's where we come in, is that the more eyes and ears that are out there looking out for the well-being of kids, the more likely we're going to catch kids who are either at risk and have not been victimized, or if they have been victimized, that we're going to be able to get that dealt with in an expedient way and not be one of those cases who gets flown into Hopkins shock trauma for a significant injury. So it's really about the large number of kids that we know are affected but aren't making it to our knowledge base. Okay, so we talked about how common this is. Now let's talk about what the harms are. So it's probably obvious um, a child who's victimized um, is going to have a life that looks different than a child who's not been victimized. There's certainly going to be medical consequences for that child. There's going to be immediate developmental and behavioral consequences for that child. But I think what might not be obvious is that what we know in looking at cohorts of kids over long periods of time into adulthood that the ramifications of early maltreatment and victimization go on to be an issue for children into their adulthood. We see that with medical vulnerability. We know through lots of great studies that victimized children end up being adults who are more likely to have cardiac disease, are more likely to die of a stroke. And so there's something about the biologic imprinting of a child who's been victimized that affects, it, affects their physiology that ends up being important for the lifespan. We also know emotionally, if you look at individuals who have chronic pain as an adult, there's actually some very good studies that show us that chronic pain sufferers who come to adult chronic pain clinics, up to a third of those individuals, when surveyed about childhood victimization, will tick yes when you ask them about childhood victimization. So again, we're talking about long-standing ramifications of this. From an emotional health standpoint, these are individuals who are more likely to have true um, psychiatric diagnoses as adults, depression and anxiety being the most likely diagnoses to be overrepresented in patients who have been victimized as children. And then when you look at sort of other arms as far as just how well we do as far as productivity and society, likelihood of having a great job, et cetera, those numbers are altered dramatically from childhood victimization. So it's something that's very important. It's important in the immediate, obviously, but it's important in the long-standing trajectory of following these victims. Now, I think the other reason to say how important this is, particularly for this audience, is that we are in the position to see parents and children in a way that no one else necessarily is. Children and parents may not be going to a preschool, may not have any interaction with an overriding other body, and it may be the only opportunity to see that kid outside of their household is when that child comes to WIC. And I think what I heard today is that 52% of all families um, utilize WIC. 
And so 52% of all children and mothers and fathers will come through our doors. That's a pretty amazing opportunity for us to be able to look at certain situations and be able to help initially make that recognition and make something different happen so that those children don't become the statistics that I just described. The cost um, is, you know, I think we're in a sort of political year and so we're talking a lot about costs. Um, there have been lots of work around how much does a single victim of child abuse cost society um, and those costs are actually astronomical. And so I think that if you're purely sort of an administrative type who are thinking about ways of saving the state money, that's another reason that we should be thinking carefully about how to deal with this um, issue. And then the law. Um, so there, we'll talk about this at the end, but there is a mandate that says that if we're concerned about a child who might be at risk, and we'll talk about that throughout this, that we have the moral slash legal responsibility to do something about that. And I think that is a really obviously sort of you know, may override, um, other aspects might override how we feel about that, but certainly the law um, has to sort of help us think about these issues. If you look at children who are reported to agencies, um, and this is children of all ages, you'll see that the education system is the largest reporting domain for kids. Now, obviously, zero to five, those kids are not within the education system, so that's not there. Um, certainly, you see that medical, social services, and legal are sort of the other big reporting responsibilities. Um, but obviously, communities at large play a significant role in the recognition and reporting of concern for child abuse and neglect. Now, we'll talk a moment about who the perpetrators are, and I think that I'll give you some statistics, but I will say to you this, that in the many years that I've been doing this, what I've learned most is that I have zero way of looking at someone and knowing or talking to someone and deciding I like or dislike them or I like or dislike how they interact um, in a way that sort of has any scientific you know, uh, veracity toward whether or not this child has been victimized. And so why that's important is that every family we engage with has the potential to victimize their children. Now again, most families don't, and we'll talk about what happens, but we have to go into every interaction with our eyes wide open and not with blinders on because they seem nice or we've worked with them before, or whatever it might be that we harbor in our minds around you know, why or why not we would suspect in this case versus another case. Um, the other thing I will say is, is that when we think about children who have been physically abused, I will tell you in my experience, most of the time, that family member did not wake up that morning with the intent to hurt their child. It wasn't as though there was this thoughtful process around hurting or victimizing the child. It's a moment in time with a situation that occurs where someone's frontal lobe, which is that part of the brain that sort of says, this is something I should do or not do, falters. Doesn't make it right. But it's rare that this is sort of a conditioned response or a, I woke up that morning planning to injure my kid. That's much rarer. And for me, people ask, how do you do this? How, you know, that's easy for me because I look at myself in the mirror and say, it could be me. If the situation was the same, it's, I'm not any different than many of the people that um, commit these, uh, these uh, acts. So of perpetrators, um, if you look at all comers, um, three of five perpetrators are female. If you are a male perpetrator, it is more likely that the injury severity will be higher so that kids die more likely from a male perpetrator. Um, and male perpetrators are absolutely the highest representation in sexual abuse cases, which to me is very different than physical abuse. That is a little bit of a different scenario whereby there's a lot of thought that goes into how to get access to a victim. And female abusers typically are younger than their male counterparts. Now this is really important, okay? Why do people end up becoming a perpetrator? Why do systems enact 
these kinds of events? Well, certainly the leading issue is a personal history of trauma. So folks who have themselves been victimized are at significantly higher risk for then victimizing in the next generation. Unrealistic parental expectations. So this is very, very important. So I think that I see this commonly in, in, in kids who, you know, the infant is not taking solids. And I have this expectation that I've got to get this kid to sleep through the night because in order for me to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get on my bus, in order to get to my job in place, I've got to have some consecutive hours of sleep. Well, as you guys know, two-month-olds are not going to easily take solids. And so this mismatch between a provider and a child and the mismatch in developmental expectation leads to frustration, which can lead to problems. So unrealistic parental expectations are very important and where we all serve a very important role to help families to understand what a child at this age does or doesn't do and what to expect of that child. We certainly know that a child who is born into a family with other children, so the idea of multiple kids in a household, increases the risk for maltreatment. That's probably multifactorial, but if you're seeing a family of eight kids and another baby is born into that household, that's a potential situation that has a higher risk profile than if that was just one child with that family. So sort of being on the alert, not to say that anybody who has multiple children are going to necessarily abuse their kid, but you can imagine that there's a lot more to deal with and so frustrations can become higher. Children who have special needs. So those special needs could be medical. Maybe they have some underlying medical condition which makes them failure to thrive. Maybe they have you know, significant medical conditions which requires lots of medicines or doctor visits, etc. Maybe it's behavioral. Maybe it's a child who has um, a spectrum of autism and doesn't react to cues in the same way that other kids react to cues. Those are children that are going to be at risk um, in, in similar ways of just adding another layer of complexity to the family dynamic. Certainly unemployment, marital discord, and substance use are very important factors that place children at risk for victimization. I will also say that just hearing that you that folks have had some training on interpersonal violence, there's great data that shows if you're a child who is born into a situation where there is IPV, there is a 30% chance that you will be maltreated or victimized yourself. So just that sort of notion of you know chaos and sort of relationship you know sort of issues becomes a very important potential risk factor. Um, for kids. Um, I'll give one anecdote which I think is a really great anecdote. Um, I've done training for our police departments, um, frontline officers, and part of that training is to talk about what do you do when you respond to an IPV call. Um, and part of that is, is you have to make sure that if there's kids in the house that you've looked at the kids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, about a year and a half ago, one of the frontline officers who was attending one of my conferences um, brought a child to our emergency department. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I brought this kid because the child was um, a child living in a house where I came to where there was significant domestic violence. And I said, oh, good for you. You know, that was really important. And she says, and something just didn't seem right. The kid didn't seem right to me. I just, my spidey, her quote, spidey vibe wasn't feeling good. And sure enough, this child had an underlying fracture of the child's bone that only because she was thoughtful enough about presenting to a call for domestic violence and remembering that if kids are there, there's a third chance that they've also been victimized, that child was probably saved from what could have been a much worse outcome. So again, that, that sort of correlation between domestic violence and child abuse, very, very important. When we think about substance abuse, I will just remind you, alcohol is the primary culprit. And so, again, it's really important for us to be aware, sure, you know, if you are using cocaine or heroin and you're out of it, but alcohol is the most prominent usage and the most prominent culprit that can be sort of associated with victimization. Did you have a question in the back? I did. Okay, just stretching. Okay, 
I wanted to at least flash on the screen the legal definition of physical child abuse. So physical child abuse is any physical injury of a child by any parent or other person who has permanent or temporary care or custody or the responsibility for supervision of a child or by any household or family member under circumstances that indicate that the child's health or welfare is harmed or at substantial risk of being harmed. Now the important thing here is that in the state of Maryland, for a child to meet the definition of physical child abuse, there has to be an injury. Okay? And that's important because, you know, I think that if you hear about folks who maybe discipline kids, okay, and may use corporal punishment as a discipline act, which I'm not going to put in any sort of vote of whether I think that's good or not, because I don't, but let's just say that is the cultural phenomenon within their house, it doesn't matter if that is their cultural prerogative. If they leave a mark, that's physical child abuse. So it's not about motivation necessarily, it's about what the act leads to. And so I think that's important for us to remember because when we interact with families, and maybe it comes out that, oh yes, you know that mark is when he was misbehaving and I hit him. Um, if there's a mark from the legal definition perspective, that's child abuse and needs to be reported. And so that's important to remember. This is in direct contrast to the legal definition of sexual abuse of which there does not need to be an injury. And so that's a very important distinction um, that we, we need to think about. Now, I did want to put in a couple of slides because I think three, four, and five-year-old children lead us to an opportunity to communicate directly with the child. And in communicating directly with the child, I want us to be sort of aware of some important primer information of how to think about talking with kids around what's going on in their household, around what's going on with an injury, because that may be part of what you're doing as you're interacting with families around questionable um, situations. So we know this, but kids understand and communicate very differently than adults. And the way that we ask questions becomes really important if we want to get information that's fruitful from a child. So ideally, you've spent a little bit of time trying to get some rapport with the kid before you start asking about a particular issue, you know, what's that bump on your head? It's better to sort of spend some time getting to know the kid, building some rapport around the kid before asking about what's that bump on your head. It's also ideal to minimize the number of folks who are in the room so that children don't feel like they're being, you know, sort of bombarded with adult figures. Um, and so it's best to be able to talk to that child, even if for just a very short period of time, um, by themselves. Here's the key. It's about open-ended questions. It's about really keeping it as broad as you possibly can and then helping the child to sort of retell the narrative in the words that the child wants to tell the narrative in. So a good open-ended question is, hey, tell me what happened to your head. And then stop. See what the kid says. I fell. Oh, tell me more about that. Well, I fell yesterday. Okay, tell me more. The least Words that come out of your mouth, the better. And the better is that children will tell the narrative, especially this age. You know, those sort of early talkers, they don't have a lot of social situational awareness to know what they should or should not tell. But if they feel like somebody's sort of like in their throat, they're not going to tell. So if you just make it a really easy environment, they're much more likely to come up with information that can be really helpful. It's also really important to remember, nothing you say is your fault. You did everything right. This is important because we want to help you. And again, I think just that statement means everything to a four or five year old kid. Learn to be a good poker player. Um, a poker face is really important. I, I have learned over the years, I talked to, like, I talked to a four year old last week and it, He's telling me these series of events, and I'm just like thinking in my mind, this is horrible. 
Um, but I had to really take my sort of best poker face and not show any reaction, because if I show a reaction, either it's going to stop the communication channel, or the child's going to get an idea that what he's telling me is bad. And so really playing poker well is important. Now, it's important to know a little bit of child development, and I'll give you like two child development slides during the course of this. This is the first. So you can think about your own kids and sort of how they're able to communicate with you. But in general, the who, what, where, when, number of times, and circumstance questions is very developmentally based. So if I'm a three-year-old, okay, if I'm a three-year-old, and someone says to me, who was with you when you got your boo-boo? They're usually able to give an accurate who. What happened, they're easily able, if they're normally developmental, to be able to give you a narrative. It might be circuitous, but they can give you a narrative about what happened. If you ask where or when, you're going to get something, but it's not accurate. And so why that's important is the downstream effects of the investigators eventually will be impacted by if you get something that's not developmentally appropriate, somebody's going to use that downstream, and potentially that will hurt the investigation. So don't ask those questions of a three-year-old. Similarly, the sort of the where and then the when, um, really for the intensive purposes of children that you're going to be interacting with, it's who and what and maybe where in a five-year-old. And that's it. OK. So there's a lot of information out there that looks at what are the risk factors. And certainly we know that when you look at epidemiologic studies, we know that there are particular parent parenting factors that put a child at risk. Again, if I'm young, if I don't have good role models, if I have unrealistic expectations, the use of corporal punishment within the household, um, whether or not there is a spouse that's supportive or unsupportive, and then inconsistent parenting from their own parents are very important aspects of um, risk. Certainly children, we talked about this, prematurity, medical disabilities, uh, developmental disabilities, and then just temperament. So you guys probably know, you see these infants who come in and they're just these lovely, docile kind of kids. You bundle them up and they sort of they calm very easily. And then there's these infants that just don't stop crying. That don't stop crying, that no matter what you do, they cry and cry and cry. They have colic, whatever it might be. Their temperament is just different. And that probably, in this age group, has the most to do with whether or not a child becomes victimized. Because that cumulative exposure to a crying child of which no matter what I do, no matter how I sort of react to that child, I get nothing, I don't get a response, brings up my frustration rate. And then if these other things are at play, I don't have somebody to hand the kid off to, I, you know, don't, I'm up 15 times over the night and then I have to worry about my other kids in the morning. Those other sort of social risk factors of social isolation, lack of extended family, those things are going to come into play. Certainly, if I have other stressors going on with respect to the economic viability of my household, if I'm sick, if I have other illness in the family, um, those things are also going to make a difference. And then if I put on a layer of maternal depression, you know, IPV, alcohol use, that's going to make it impossible. So it's, it's multifactorial. Not one of these risk factors is usually at play, but you put a couple in the wrong situation and something bad happens. I will say, I put this up here because there's no such thing as the Beaver Cleaver family. I mean, the most wonderfully put together families, um, again, you know, I take care of children who are victims from professional families who are doctors and lawyers and have fabulous sort of resource, et cetera, there's no such thing as a family that can't do it. And I think, again, I'm honing in on this because we all have our own biases when we think about child abuse. We go into it thinking about it's this you know, certain category of person who would do this to, this to their kid. I will tell you, see, in lots and lots of these cases, it can happen to anybody. It's about the constellation of risk factors that can hit anybody. Um, and makes it really hard um, if you're not thinking about the child and the child's potential injury without putting the other framework on board. So those risk factors are important, 
They're important from an epidemiologic risk, but what I would like to empower you with is that every family who you interact with, they may be the family that you could save the child in. So be thoughtful about this in every interaction, regardless of what the family looks like or what your perspective of that family is. Now getting to sort of injuries, um, it's all about what the kid can do, right? So it's all about what is this child's developmental age and from that, what's my expectation of what the child can do to him or herself, right? Because if we hear stories about, oh, he fell or he rolled off the bed or he did this or that, the first starting point is, does that make sense from a developmental capacity perspective? Can a child of that age actually mobilize the right motor forces to allow that to happen? And why is that important? Because let's just talk about bruising in kids, okay? If you look at studies that just look at thousands and thousands of kids, kids who are under six months rarely, rarely, rarely ever bruise. Less than 1% of the time of all comers less than six months have bruises when they go to the doctor. Now, why is that? Because if you think about a less than six month old, <clears throat> they don't do much. Their motor capacity is limited. And so the more limited your motor capacity is, the less likely you're going to end up with an event that causes a bruise. It makes sense. Once children get up on their feet and start cruising and become top heavy, do they bruise? Of course they bruise but they have to have the mobility in order to create an event that causes them to bruise. So you'll see that the age sort of matches what the developmental capability is. So this is important because if I see a child who, development, who might be 15 months, but developmentally is at the two month level, and I know two month olds don't do anything except basically move their head around, that child shouldn't be bruised. Now again, nothing's an absolute. It doesn't mean with 100% certainty that this was an abusive event, but it certainly means that you should be, wait a minute, how the heck did this infant get a bruise? And I probably need to get help because this is something that I don't expect to happen in someone that doesn't have that motoric ability. So just to remind ourselves, again, you know, two-month-olds, four-month-olds, they do a little bit of movement, but not a whole lot. Six-month-olds begin to do a little bit of unsupported sitting. Eight-month-olds crawl. Nine-month-old cruise. Twelve-month-olds walk. Twenty-four-month-olds and, you know, sort of go up steps. So just having that is, is our variability around this. Of course, there's variability. But in general, if you look at cohorts of children, this is the normal progression of age and development. Okay. So... Let's say a child walks into your office and the child has an obvious bruise on their head. And you say, that's what happened to Johnny. And they say, well, I don't know, nothing. I mean, that's nothing. Didn't, not, nothing happened. That's a red flag. I mean, you guys know a bruise when you see it. And so a bruise is a bruise is a bruise. And if there's complete denial of any traumatic history, not to say it's abusive, but that's a red flag. That's a pink flag, at least, that says to me, I need to understand this better and I need help to understand this better. Maybe they say, well, Johnny, who's two months old, rolled off the bed and hit the dresser. Well, that don't make a whole lot of sense because I just told you two-month-olds don't roll. And so that certainly is a red flag and needs more information slash understanding. Maybe the story just kind of morphs over time. So, you know, the registration staff member sees this child and says, well, it looks like Johnny has a bruise over here. What's going on? Oh, he rolled off the bed. And then when the kid gets in the back and starts getting intake, the intake provider says what happened and the story changes a little bit. There's telephone happens, right, the game of telephone. But the game of telephone is a red flag, is a red flag. When that story changes over the time that your agency is interacting with this family, big red flag. He did it to himself. I'm going to say this is very common. Um, I hear this all the time. It's not to say there aren't circumstances that kids can inflict trauma to themselves, but that's a red flag. 
Okay, so it's not to say it's, it doesn't happen, but at the forefront in this very broad screening that we need to be doing because we're the only people that can, because kids aren't coming anywhere else, that should be a red flag to you. The sibling did it. So I hear that all the time too. It's not to say siblings can't injure babies. But again, that's a red flag. Because if a sibling is able to injure a baby, that a baby ends up having a significant obvious injury, something's going on that we need to deal with anyhow. Um, and again, most of the time, I will tell you, there's not a lot of great data that siblings cause significant injury. And so when the sibling did it, you need to be, I need some more information, this is a red flag. Maybe it all makes sense, but gosh, you're seeing this family and you're seeing this like healed up, like nasty looking thing, and you're like, what happened? And they say, oh, you know, he took a spill. Um, I fell on the ice. He spilled. Okay, that makes sense, you know. But then it looks so awful. And you say, so, you know, what are you doing to treat it? Oh, you know. So then that delay in treatment, again, doesn't mean it was necessary, necessarily abuse, but should serve as a red flag to you. Like, what's the barriers for this family to get the appropriate treatment? Maybe it's truly barriers around the healthcare system and mobilizing it, or maybe it's barriers that I didn't necessarily want to bring the child into the healthcare system because of whatever happened. Multiple injury types. So again, you're undressing the baby, you're weighing the baby. You saw this little thing like maybe here, but then you see this other little thing maybe here. Anytime you see multiple stuff, big red flag. Maybe you maybe you'd blow off this little tiny nail mark that's on the child here. But if there's a nail mark here and there's a nail mark here, not to say it can't happen, but we need to be thinking, is there more to this story? I need to be thoughtful about this story. And then there's this thing that people call pathognomonic injuries. And I hate this because it basically says if you have this injury type, it's absolutely abuse. I don't think there's anything like that in the world. There's nothing that's absolute. You have to understand everything in its individual context. But there are particular things that have a very high sensitivity and specificity. If you see it, it is much more likely than not abusive. And so certainly from a frontline perspective, if you see it, you need to work the channels because this is abuse until proven otherwise. This is just that sort of slide that I talked to you about crying patterns. So there's been a lot of work around infant crying. Um, and we know that crying peaks around five to six weeks of age. And so what's very interesting is that when you look at rates of victimization in children, that peak is when you start seeing the victimization. It tends to be around five, six weeks, and then there's uh, several weeks afterwards that children are, are more likely to be victimized. That makes sense, right? So you've got this really difficult baby. Like you can do it for a couple of weeks. You know, you can mobilize your resources, but you, then you're sleep deprived for four and a half weeks, you've got nobody, you're trying to get to your workplace, etc. That sort of cumulative exposure is probably what kids put, puts kids at risk. Why do I say this to you? Because you know when you're seeing families, right? So if you're seeing a family right in this time frame, and you say to yourself, I know this is a time that kids are really rough, you might want to spend a little bit more time thinking about how's this family doing, how's this baby look, knowing that there is this vulnerability around that peak crying time. Okay, where do ambulatory, kids who are able to get up on their feet, so we said it happens around nine months when they pull up and start cruising, and then by 12 to 15 months they're kind of going, so where do kids normally bruise if they're going to bruise? This is pretty um, well studied. It's sort of understood very well. Kids are top heavy, right? They got big heads in relation to their body. So when they take a spill, what's the first thing to hit? So it is not uncommon for a child to have, you know, a goose egg. People call them goose eggs. Um, that, you know, again, I'm not a six-month-old, but if I'm a 15-month-old and I'm a walking and running and trying to do my thing, having a goose egg on the head in and of itself isn't going to worry me from that injury perspective. Kids also bruise when they're mobile over bones. Makes sense. It's a short distance between the skin and the bone, and the bone serves as kind of like a hard object for the bruise to happen. So you know kids, they run around and they bump into things. Where they bump in, they hit their shins, right? Shins are a very common area 
for mobile kids to injure. Now, these are less likely to happen from the normal rough and tumble of childhood. Okay? If a child has an injury, if a child under the age of 15 months has any visible injury kind of above the collarbone, that's a very, very important, very important thing. It's not to say it can't happen, but if it's on the face or the ears or the mouth or the nose, those are very, very unlikely areas to be injured from the normal rough and tumble of being an early walker. Okay? Um, certainly, inner aspects of arms, inner aspects of legs, they're inner aspects because they were created to be inner aspects, and so they're less likely to be injured from the normal environmental mobilization of kids. It's not to say it's an absolute, but it's very uncommon to happen from just normal rough and tumble of childhood. The back. So, you know, when you put that baby into the, into the um, scale and you notice a little hint of a bruise over the back, that's a really important red flag. That's a very unlikely area for a child, even an ambulatory child, a 15-month-old child, to bruise. It's not to say it's 100%, but it's much less likely. Here's something also that's really important to remember. Nobody, nobody, the best doctors in the world, cannot date bruises. So please don't try to date bruises yourself. You know, when a mom said, oh, that happened when they were at their grandfather's, you know, four days ago. Well, it may have, but we have no, I can't date a bruise. Um, so we stay away from that, you know, in your interpretation of what's being said or what you're seeing. Okay, this is Nick. Nick is a um, almost four-month-old. Um, Nick is the third child in this family. Um, mom and dad are together. Um, mom and dad um, both uh, utilize WIC services. Um, this baby comes in with mom and the two-year-old brother um, for an intake. And you just sort of are looking at Nick and you see Nick's ear. Anybody want to comment on what they see and how they feel about it? Okay. Looks like it hurts. Yeah, why does it look like it hurt? It's red. Yep. Anybody else? So, you know, there's sort of this kind of purplish redness here, here, and here. Right? It's kind of weird. He's a very fair-skinned kid. And you see this purplish redness on the ear. It's in a place that isn't the outermost place. Great. It's further deep in, which is kind of unusual. So um, for the folks um, who are not present here, um, what was just said is in, it's in a place that's fairly deep in, which seems unusual, um, which I would agree. So what would you do? How would you think? I mean, you're meeting this family. They're sort of in your space. Um, there's nothing else. There's, you know, it seems like a regular, normal encounter. Um, so, what do you, what do you, how would you sort of approach this? What would people think? Question the mother that brought the child in. Okay. Okay. So, what was said in the room was, I questioned the mother, asking what happened to Nick. Um, and so, that's what was done. Um, Mom said that Nick fell from the carrier to the floor. So she was um, transitioning Nick from um, bassinet to carrier, um, and she put Nick in carrier, and then she was holding carrier, but she claims that she hadn't strapped him in completely, and she missed step, and Nick fell out of the carrier and fell on the floor. I think that's an odd place for a bruise if he fell out of the carrier. So what was said was that's an odd place for a bruise if he fell out of the carrier, and I would agree. So again, What's really important is I told you that in children all ages, non-ambulatory or ambulatory, ears are weird places to bruise. So when we see an ear bruise, we should say to ourselves, uh-uh, that's a problem until proven otherwise. Now again, maybe somebody could say to me, well, how do I know Nick doesn't have some medical problem? That's not for us to discern um, because up front, it is much more likely that Nick has been victimized than has a medical problem that makes his ear bleed. 
And so rightly so, this injury should absolutely present itself to say to you, I'm worried about Nick, and I need to do the right things to make sure Nick is safe. Now, I'll tell you the unfortunate story on Nick. Um, Nick, I, I made up the part that he was in the WIC office. Um, Nick was actually in a primary care pediatrician's office. Um, Mom told the story as described. The pediatrician who had taken care of the two-year-old and know this mom really, really well felt like the story was okay. Um, and Nick went off, and Nick came back a week later to a local emergency department um, with very severe injuries requiring an intensive care unit stay. Um, and in fact, this ear injury was only the signal that in fact this child had head injury at the same time. And so had that primary care pediatrician thought outside of that focus framework that they had, they liked this family, this mom was great, they took care of the other kid, all was good, Nick could have hopefully been preserved further injury and the outcome probably would have been better for him. Again, just to hone it in, Cruising is everything when it comes to bruising, and so non-cruising babies, we don't expect them to bruise. Okay, here's a three-year-old. This is a three-year-old who came in during early spring. Um, it's probably the first very warm day, and so he's wearing shorts. And um, he comes in, um, nothing out of the ordinary, and you notice that there's some bruising on his legs. He um, is a very active kid. He's very normal. Um, he's kind of all over the place. You can't get him to sit still for a second. Um, and so this is all you got. You know, you're sort of just interacting with them in the same way. Mom's come in, you know, as a registrant, and she happens to bring her son. Um, what do you think about these bruises? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. He's been outside fighting, falling, and having fun, and being a normal little kid. So what was said in the room is that he's been outside playing, falling, having fun, being a normal kid. So um, it sounds like there's not a lot of concern from um, folks here. Anybody disagree? So I would agree. This is a kiddo who developmentally is on his feet. He's actually all over the place. He's got bruising, but where's the bruising? It's all in exposed areas that are over bones, right? It's the shins, it's the knees. It's not to say that he couldn't have been abused. I mean, anything can happen. But this in and of itself should not raise a whole lot of red flags because this is okay location over bones in a kid that can mobilize himself to get those bruises. Here's a little two-month-old um, who presents, it doesn't show up all that well there, um, but basically has some bruising here and here. So kind of over the shoulder area. And then a little bit, oh, whoops. And a little bit maybe here, kind of underneath the ear. So what do you think? Two month old with bruising over the shoulder, kind of neck near ear. Who's okay with this? I see a lot of negativity in the room. That's good. That's good, because this is a kid that can't move much, right? This kid's doing this. Um, and bruising in that location and somebody that doesn't move that much should absolutely be a red flag. Absolutely should be a red flag. Here's a little baby. Um, also, I think two-ish months. Um, happy, beautiful baby, well-nourished baby, um, who has this bruising right here in this little line with this little bruise right here. What do you think? You like it? You don't like it? Why? Um, speak up. I was just thinking it looked like somebody could have grabbed the baby around the chest. And okay, so again, I don't want anybody to have to think about like what actually happened. That's not the job of anybody in the room. But you say to yourself, kid who doesn't do anything, who's got bruises along the rib cage? Ooh, that's worrisome. I need to do something about it. Great, good. Um, just a close-up of that. There's even a little, little, little nick there, right? Here's another example of a baby who had pretty significant bruising to the ear. Um, this child had um, very significant head injury as well. Here's a little baby that we saw recently. Um, 
good looking baby, really good looking baby. And gosh, it's even hard to see on that screen, but it has this very faint, very faint little line here and here. Um, I'll tell you, that faint line was kind of not, it wasn't sort of, didn't ring out at anybody. Um, so this baby had seen uh, a nurse, had seen a daycare provider, had seen another ER, and nobody actually had picked up on that little tiny bruise. The kid was coming in because they were fussy. My baby's a little fussy, not feeding great, a little fussy, a little more spitting up. In fact, that tiny bruise was the symptom of significant belly trauma. That baby had pancreatitis and the liver was impaired. So that very, very subtle bruise in a baby that's not going to do that on their own should be a red flag to you and should say, uh-uh, I don't like that. We need to get more and we need to make this sort of mobilize the team response. Now, the other thing to remember is that even if you're mobile and even if it's a bony surface, Children don't bruise in patterns for the most part, okay? So when I see pattern marks, I should also be worried. So here's a great example, four-year-old, daycare. He's doing the sort of shimmy in the chair. He doesn't sit still. Daycare provider says, what's going on? He says nothing. He continues to shimmy in the chair. Um, daycare sort of looks at him, takes him and says, oh, gosh, what happened to your back? I fell off the chair. Well, daycare provider was smart enough to say, how the heck do you bruise in such a pattern way if you fall off the chair? And so appropriately mobilized the response to call Child Protective Services, and in fact, he was hit with the belt. Again, patterns are not normal, right? So anytime I see patterns, even if they're over bones, this is a, a mobile 15-month-old, but again, what in the world? That's not normal. I need to be worried. Obviously, patterns, again, I need to be worried. You know, so I see these patterns around the neck. Um, I'll tell you, this was looked over by several people. Um, so again, these are sometimes very subtle, but children should not bruise or injure in patterns. When they bruise or injure in patterns, from your perspective, it's abuse until proven otherwise, and we need to mobilize a response. More of the same. Here's a little guy. Um, this little guy had um, pretty significant um, bruising, kind of in the facial area, around the eye. Um, you can see some here and here. And, and this is a case that's unfortunate because this kiddo was seen by some really good ER docs um, who said to mom, what's going on? And she said, oh, he's been coughing. You know, it's the middle of winter. He's had a horrible cough. And so, you know, sometimes when you cough, you can get little tiny, little, little baby, like, red spots around the eyes. Okay, but this doesn't quite look like that, but they really liked the mom, and the, everything was sort of good. Again, these are not things that I would expect. More of the same. More of the same. So any type of pattern, we need to be worried about abuse. Okay, so it's about what's the age of the child, what's his developmental capabilities, where is the bruise, is it in an area if he's mobile that I expect it to be, and then what does it look like? It shouldn't be patterned if it's going to be an accidental bruise. So just to sort of put it all together, inflicted bruises are typically in weird places. They're typically patterned, they're typically multiple, and the story doesn't make a ton of sense. Accidental bruises, they're mobile, the history fits, and they're usually over bony surfaces. Okay, so that's your take home. Now there are a few very common things that I want you to know about, because you will see them all the time if you're just weighing children. So this is what, anybody know what this is? This is an um, African-American little, uh, like, two-week-old baby who's got, these are Mongolian spots. And Mongolian spots are really, really common. Okay? In certain populations of kids, Asian population, up to 90% of kids will have a Mongolian spot. And so you're going to see a lot of these. Now, they are typically over the butt. So that's typically where you're going to find them. But, and this is another example of sort of Mongolian spots. They look different than bruises, don't they? They're kind of slate, slate in color. Um, they just, they certainly don't hurt. 
you know, when you touch them, there's no response. But you can have them in weirder locations. So this was a kid who went to daycare, and the daycare provider saw this for the, you know, they had not seen this kid before, and they called it into CPS, and CPS said, oh my God, and so the kid got yanked out of the family's household, and it was all, it all ended up being okay, but it was because it was a Mongolian spot in a location that people weren't accustomed to seeing it. Now, what if I see this? So this is a little baby who is um, two weeks old. This little baby is a beautiful, thriving baby, except that when the baby opens their eyes, you see that the baby has some blood in the white of the eye. So what do you think? Worried, not worried? Worried, worried I hear. And I would agree, worried. Um, there's actually some really interesting data that says infants who have blood, we call them subconjunctival hemorrhage, but it's basically blood in the white of the eye. Um, that's what we call a sentinel injury, meaning that if you see it, it is likely to be representative of something a lot worse. And so this baby actually had significant head injury in addition to that blood in the, in the eye. And so any blood in the eye of a child, now a newborn who literally has just passed through the vaginal canal, that's a different scenario. And so it can be a little hard in that first sort of week to discern, but certainly kids who are older than a couple weeks old, blood in the, fresh blood in the eye should be a significant red flag to you and should say, this is abuse until proven otherwise and I need to mobilize the right response. Similarly, any injuries to the child's mouth is very important. So from the perspective of feeding infants, this is not an uncommon scenario. So what happens? Baby is taking the bottle, baby is doing well with the bottle, but baby is not sleeping over the night. So mom asks grandma, what should I do? Grandma says, why don't you give the baby some solids? That'll keep them sleeping. So mom buys some Gerber, puts it on a spoon, puts it into the baby's mouth. What does the baby do? The baby's tongue thrusts it out because that's what babies do at that age. That's the right thing to do. Well, grandma said that I should give this baby solids. Let me try again. Same thing happens. Over time, that becomes frustrating. And so I might, maybe not even with motivation to injure, but I might end up pushing that spoon a little too hard and injuring the child's mouth. And so this is very important. This is actually a, um, the frenulum, which is the piece of skin that attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth, um, where that has been injured by the spoon. And so force feeding, and this is very important from your perspective, is really important and acts as one of those sentinel injuries. These get missed all the time. These get missed all the time. So if you're working with families around feeding and looking and such, you want to make sure you educate them around when babies are ready to take a spoon and then make sure that you're not ignoring subtle injuries to the mouth. Okay, I'm going to transition now to burns. So burns are very common injuries in children, okay? When you look at series of burns, up to a quarter of all burns in pediatric patients are eventually attributed to abuse or neglect. Okay? So that's a lot of kids. Um, we see on average <clears throat> about 10 burns a week in the children's center because we're the burn center. So these are common injuries. You're going to see them all the time. Um, and we need to be sort of mindful of when a burn is worrisome and when a burn is not worrisome. Contextually, contextually, the most common scenarios that people intentionally burn their kids is around toilet training and is around kids who have like a stomach bug. And so why is that? Because it's about, I need my kid to be toilet trained because daycare gets significantly cheaper when we're out of diapers and I'm trying from a developmental perspective something to toilet train my kid when they're developmentally not ready to be toilet trained and I get really frustrated because they keep soiling their clothes and I got to do laundry a lot. Similar to when my kid has a stomach bug, soil clothes, I got to do laundry a lot. That sets the frustration tone with a lot of those other multifactorial things at play. And so I wash my kid off and maybe I make it little, a little too hot so that 
perhaps they'll remember next time not to soil themselves. It's not rational, there's no rationality to that, but it's not an uncommon context. And so I think that's a really important thing to recognize is that if people are in the midst of toilet training, that contextually is a high risk situation for kids when it comes to intentional burns. Obviously, it's not just about that sort of context. There's parental issues and there's community issues that are at play here as well. So, as I said, burns are really common. So if I'm ambulatory, right, it's all about do I, am I standing on my feet, am I able to walk? If I'm able to walk and if I am able to reach and grab, so we're talking about, you know, 15 months-ish, what do we see? Can kids get burned accidentally? Absolutely. Well, how does that happen? They pull down a hot object, right? So I put the coffee cup down on the coffee table, the dog's barking, I turn my head for a second, my ambulatory 15-month-old comes around and pulls the coffee off the coffee table. What happens? Hot coffee hits the child, they get burned. The hot coffee goes downward because gravity forces it downward. And the burn typically takes this very classic um, association that looks like a triangle. The worst of the burn is up here because that's where it hits. And as it flows downward, the heat is dissipated, so the burn gets less significant. Now, let's compare that to this. If I want to intentionally burn a kid, what typically happens? The kid typically is not going to just let me put them in hot water. So there is going to be some force of placing the child in that hot water. That will create the child to sort of, you know, kind of get very stiff. And the stiff areas do not allow the hot liquid to get there. So you'll see these areas of sparing. Similarly, if I throw a kid in the bottom of a porcelain tub and I keep them there, what will happen? Well, the butt cheeks will be protected by the porcelain because the porcelain to butt will not allow water in there. And so I'll get this, what's described as sort of donut hole um, area. And so it's kind of a classic description of uh, immersion burns. All right. Here's an 18-month-old happy, healthy, developmentally normal little girl who um, mom tells the story. You know, she comes in there. She's obviously burned. Mom says, oh, my God, can you believe this happened? I put my coffee cup down on the coffee table. I turned my head for a second, and she was burned. She screamed. She yelled. I basically picked her up. I put her um, in the cold shower. Um, it started to, you know, get a little bit sort of funny. I put some bacitracin on it. I have an appointment with a pediatrician right after I leave here today. What do you think? Do you like it? Do you not like it? And why? So I see a, a naysayer in the back. Yeah, I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Um, because it looks like it gets worse as it goes farther down, and it looks like there's bruising on her right uh, wrist too over there too. So no bruising on the wrist. So the burn is definitely you know from here down, and it's worse here than it is here. And there's a little bit of splash here. Others? I still wonder why she came to us. Okay. To the doctor okay. So you're sort of like, I don't quite understand the pattern of how you've decided to seek service. I think that's certainly reasonable. And anytime that is something that's concerning, that should mobilize a response. Um, I think a significant burn like this that it doesn't, hasn't been attended to in general, deserves to mobilize a response. I'll tell you that this particular burn was completely as described. When the scene investigators went to the house, there was coffee all over the floor. Um, there was a cup still down on the floor. Um, and so there was nothing else that was sort of concerning. And again, it sort of takes that pattern that we described, that sort of triangular pattern um, of, you know, you can imagine a kid reaching, it falls onto kid, it streams down. Um, but again, I think that if you're worried because of service selection, I think that's a reasonable worry. This is the same story. This looks a lot different, right? So how does this kid get the hot liquid to his back? Got to be a pretty sort of ambidextrous, I don't know how you do it sort of scenario. This is like as bad up at the top as it is at the bottom. There's this line of demarcation here, like how the heck did that happen? So this is a very worrisome burn um, and eventually was confessed to be a dipping into a hot liquid in a pot. This mom had severe mental health issues. 
Um, this was a mom down on the eastern shore who was um, trying very hard to raise four kids herself, um, had a lot of economic issues. Um, this particular child was the last of the series of kids. This mom had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Mom was not compliant with her mental health regimen. Mom was hearing voices that told her to injure her child, to exercise the child of the demons. So again, multifactorial doesn't make it good, but your role is to recognize this doesn't make sense at all. Again, here's another one. This is an a ambulatory kiddo who has um, significant burns to the hands. Um, does this make sense from any way, shape, or form? No, no right? No way, shape, or form. Um, just to sort of remind us that it's all about how hot's the water with the exposure to the skin. And so it is important to know from families' perspectives, you know, was the water coming out at 120 or was the cut water coming out at 140? Because at 120 degrees, it takes 10 minutes to get a burn. Your skin has to be subjected for 10 minutes to 120 degree water versus at 140, it takes 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. I saw a kid last week whose hot water heater was set so that the water coming out of it was 160, one second to get a significant burn. And so again, your first responses to these cases does not necessarily mean that this family is going to be indicated for abuse. Your first responses are going to be, we need to find out more information because even if it was 160 degrees coming out of the faucet, this family needs help in order to get the landlord to fix the hot water heater. And so we're mobilizing a response to understand the situation. We are not in the business in the front line to necessarily decide you know, this is or is not. It's about making sure that you're serving as that safety net. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So infant skin is not adult skin. Um, we can't do the study. Huh? Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The question was um, from the audience: Is infant skin different to adult skin? Because the audience member described liking to run the shower very hot, not knowing exactly what the temperature is, but not succumbing to burns. And the answer is yes. Infant skin is different. Um, you really can't test the hypothesis because you can't have a series of pots at different temperatures and subject infants to them to figure out exactly what there's. You can't even do that in adults anymore. This data is from adult data, um, <laughs> but you know we're in more civilized times, so that's good. Um, but so yes, there's going to be a lower vulnerability, and all of this information is based upon adult uh, data. <clears throat> Again, just examples of burn patterns that should be worrisome to you. Okay. So this is one that you may see, okay? So this is obviously not a baby, but it will look the same on a baby. Um, this is a burn, and this should immediately evoke a certain response in you as to what might have caused this. Any guesses? Cigarette, cigarette burn, absolutely. And so cigarette burns are important. They're very circular, typically eight millimeters in diameter. They are deeper in the center, so there tends to be sort of a almost a divot in the middle with the surrounding area being not quite as involved because it's hottest at the center of the cigarettes. Um, and you'll see them in kids also. Um, and so I would say that of the burns that are likely to pass through your doors, these are probably the more likely ones to pass through the doors that can be easily missed if we're not primed for them. Now. This baby has not been injured, actually. This is a baby who has these findings. Now, what's interesting, though, is you see that you know, this doesn't quite look like the other ones we saw, right? And this doesn't quite look like the other ones we saw. So this is actually an infection um, called impetigo. Impetigo is like a staph infection. You may have heard of that. Um, and they look different. They're not quite as symmetric as a cigarette burn is. They definitely don't look divoted out in the middle. And you tend to see sort of some satellite or other areas where you'll see some injury as well as the primary lesion. So those are the ones that people can get confused by. Do I have any other questions about physical abuse? Because I'm going to end up talking about sexual abuse in the last 15 minutes. 
Okay. So let's say four-year-old Sarah is brought into a WIC appointment with mom who is pregnant. She's a very um, interactive, um, uh, pretty, she's a busy kid. And she comes in and she's sort of like, you know, flying off the floor and says to the receptionist, hey, do you want to see the dance that I learned? And she does this somewhat provocative dance in the middle of the reception area. And the receptionist says, what's that about? Honey, where'd you learn that? And she says, kind of smugly, my daddy. So what do you think? What do you think about that scenario? Are you thoughtful? Are you not thoughtful? Does it raise a bell of, well, should I do something? Do I need more information? What are people thinking? I heard from my <laughs> latter side, it's weird, okay? <laughs> Any other thoughts? How would she even see that? Yeah. Okay, so the answer from the, the front moves. was, I mean, how would I see this to know the moves? Well, if she, no, if she was watching Beyonce. So Beyonce may have been the culprit. Well, then she said my daddy, so why is my daddy yeah, showing me how to dance like that? <laughs> other ideas or thoughts? Need more information. Yeah, need more information. Yeah. So, go ahead. For, a little bit farther about, you know, dancing or what else, studying what other kind of dances does Daddy show you, or you know, just just asking a question. Okay, okay. So I'll tell you that what the little girl says is basically she loves going to Daddy's house, um, and Daddy and her dance, and that's basically all you get. She's a four-year-old who's like all over the place and not all that you know, in, interested in invoking in a conversation. Mom and dad are not together. So there's some miss, mom doesn't trust dad. They're sort of in a nasty custody battle. So mom's like, I don't know, he's a jerk. So that's kind of all you're going to get. So what do you think? Is it going to? It's weird. It's, okay, so what do, you, what do you do with that? It's weird. <laughs> you know, so do you feel like you, you need to do something or do you just say, it's weird, but it happens. Do something, because you never know if it turns out that it's nothing great. But what if it is something? So what I heard from my side was do something, because if it turns out it's nothing great, but what if it is something? She's a four-year-old, so the equivalent of what question is the only question she can get answered. There you go. That's all she's told you. Great. So what was um, recited from the front of the room here, remembering one of my slides earlier, is she's four. You can only reliably get the who and the what questions. So that's all you're going to get. Any other thoughts? Anybody disagree? Anybody like, well, not enough here for me to be worried. Everybody's worried. OK. Let's go through it. So how do we define sexual abuse? So sexual abuse is any contact or conduct that's unwanted or manipulative, or exploitive, or outside developmentally appropriate play by a parent, a caregiver, a household member, or a family member. Okay, so that's the legal definition. So when we think about sexual abuse, no typical profile. Most of these people, people are like, oh my god, can't believe that. Um, most of these people are male, at least the reported perpetrators. Most are familiar to the child. And the scary statistic, I think, is up to 40% of perpetrators are adolescents. Of those adolescents, most of those adolescents have been victimized themselves. And so you can't really make anything of the individuals in these scenarios. What I will say is, different than physical abuse, these are people who woke up that morning and planned and thought through how they were going to get access to that child and how they were going to sort of groom that child to sort of you know, get into their web. The children, most of these kids are female, but again, these are only the cases that make it to anyone's attention. Peak ages is 5 to 7 and then 14 to 15. So those are the peak ages that you may see. So 5-year-olds might be the ones that you would potentially come in contact with. <clears throat> when you look at studies that look at behavior, because this is important, this is about a behavior, what are common behaviors when you survey children and families who have not been abused. These are the common behaviors that you see related to sexualized behaviors that are not associated with abuse. These are the behaviors that are highly associated with abuse. 
So you see that there's a very different flavor to the types of behaviors that we're talking about. And again, this comes up pretty good when you look at any predictive modeling as far as what behaviors you're worried about. So very different than these kinds of behaviors. So when we go back to Sarah, this is a kid who is having a behavior of dancing. And that's really it. That's really it. It's kind of in the middle, right? It's sort of not quite on either of those lists. And so I think it's totally appropriate to be worried and to want to understand more. And in this case, you're not probably going to be able to get more because of the situation that you're in and the lack of ability for the kid to give you more. Ends up that this case is about kid goes to dad's house. Dad's house is the only house that has cable. Um, at dad's house, MTV is a little bit dated case. MTV is available. And child was looking at Britney Spears, actually. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so what's interesting about it is, is that when they got this kid into um, a forensic interviewer and you know, she's sort of giving the dance, the kid starts singing the Britney Spears song. And then they were able to no negotiate that, oh, I only know, get to watch Britney Spears when I'm at daddy's house. Is daddy in the room? No, daddy's not in the room. He's usually upstairs doing his work. So it sort of changes the flavor. But you probably wouldn't be able to discern that in that front line. <clears throat> so just for information's sakes only, when we think about sexual abuse and you think about exams, um, exams are there to have forensic collection of evidence only if the event occurred very recently. So if you're out of that window, there is no reason for a child to go ramp running to get an exam. Unless that child's having some physical or psychological complaint, and what is the exam for? It's to document injury, collect forensic evidence. But these exams should only be, by, be done by people who know what they're doing. So the general pediatrician or the general ER doc, not good people to be doing these exams. Some myths about the exam. We can tell for sure if she's been abused. We can tell if she's been penetrated. We need to look inside of her. If she's got a hole, she's been abused. If the hole's too big, she's been abused. None of that's true. None of that's true. And really and truly, the bottom line is, of children who confession from perpetrators of true penetration, 95% of their exams are normal. So really what we're doing is assuring families and kids that they're OK physically, and potentially finding forensic evidence if we're in that window of a very short time frame. And so that's important to remember. <coughs> I'm going to finish with a little bit of the system. So as I started off with is you folks are in an amazing sphere of opportunity to serve as a protective agent of kids. You're seeing kids when nobody else may be seeing kids except the household that they live in. And so for that reason, you should be thinking about this every time you interact with a family. And when you're worried, you have the mandate to report. So in every state of the union and in the state of Maryland, there is a law that's the mandated reporter law. That law basically says that if you have reason to be concerned, okay, it's not about you have proof. If you have reason to be concerned, then you have the obligation to report. Now, for people like myself and other people who are in described domains, teachers, doctors, nurses, they have an actual mandate by their professional society to, to uh, report, or they can actually be stripped of their licensure and professional stature. But every citizen in Maryland is a mandated reporter. And it is your moral obligation to think about this, and if you're worried, to make sure that the system mobilizes in a way that's going to protect kids. Again, this is not about proof. And I think everybody I interact with who's like, I don't think I have enough. Like, all I saw was that one bruise on the ear. That's all you need, OK? You need nothing more. It's not to say that that child's been abused necessarily, but it means that there needs to be more information that you, <coughs> in your frontline capacity, don't have an opportunity to be able to do. And so that's what I want you to take home with, is that 
you have an opportunity to see infants and kids in ways that nobody else does. And when you see something that we've talked about that's concerning, you need to make sure you mobilize the appropriate response so that the system can do a better investigation and potentially protect the child if that's what's in play. Uh, again, it's reason to believe that the child has been subject to abuse. There is nothing about proof. Um, and if you make a report, you are immune from liability if made in good faith. So again, where this gets problematic is if the neighbor keeps calling in reports and reports and reports, but there's an obvious sort of issue between the neighbor and the parent, and there's malwill in calling in these reports, that's different. But if you are a citizen of the state of Maryland and you are looking out for the best interests of the child, you will have no liability for making a report and potentially will have an effect to save a child from further victimization. I'm going to stop there because my voice is gone, um, but I am happy to entertain any questions, scenarios that you guys have had come up in the past, um, or any reflections that are important for folks.